Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. The Supreme Court has uh, tilted more towards idealism in the recent years compared to realism in the past due to socio-political and economic changes taking place in the country, a senior judge of uh, the top court said on Saturday. Justice Ranjan Gogoi compared the Supreme Court's 2017 verdict on triple talaq, that is the Shaira Banu case and the 1985 ruling on the right to alimony, that is the Shah Banu case, to support his point. The injustices today were not born out of poverty or illiteracy alone, but due to different identities, diverse opinions and aspirations for autonomy, he said. What happens in the apex court impacts all of us. So it is crucial to understand this important issue. To put the issue into perspective for us, I have with me on the program Justice R.S. Sodhi, former Delhi High Court judge, Soli Sorabji, former Attorney General of India, and Satya Prakash, legal editor of the Tribune. Thank you so much to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Justice Sodhi, I'd like to begin with you first, of course. You know, let's uh, try and understand what the Supreme Court uh, uh, judge means by realism and idealism. You know, I for one, I do not uh, understand what he actually meant because um, according to me, as far as the Supreme Court is concerned, it should be fair, just and equitable. That is all the interpretation that is needed. Idealism or realism of any otherism uh, doesn't find a place in the Constitution or interpretation of any laws. Okay, let me bring in... Let me bring in uh... Uh, Mr. Sorabji into the picture. Now, you know, Mr. Sorabji, what has changed over over time? You know, the example given by the uh, by the judge, of course, of the Shara Banu and the Shah Banu case, you know, uh, can, can we draw any parallels about, or can we talk about how uh, the two verdicts are vastly different? Well, vastly different, but they all reflect, they reflect the current most of the society. It can't be static. The Supreme Court when it gives an interpretation. It has to be realistic in the sense that it does not take account of the existing circumstances. What was said in 1965 cannot be the same in 2005, for example. So in that sense, it's an evolving thing. It's not something which is rooted. It's not something which is fixed in a particular point of time because of particular ideology. And I think what the judge meant, well, I also don't know, I agree with Justice Sodhi, that what exactly meant was, but I suppose he meant is that the Supreme Court will give its judgments, its verdicts, taking into account the current circumstances, the current set of values, the current set of ideologies. Sure. Let me bring in Satya Prakash now. You know, what has changed over the years, Satya Prakash, and how has this transition really taken place? Well, uh, Supreme Court as an institution, it has really evolved over the decades. In the last 68 years since the uh, Constitution started, rather uh, we gave, gave to ourselves the Constitution, it has evolved and it has changed. As an institution, it has changed. Uh, in the first decade of uh, the Constitution, there were hardly any, I think, perhaps one enactment uh, that the Supreme Court declared on constitutional. Otherwise, most of, in most of the cases, they would say whatever has been enacted by Parliament, it's fine. But second decade onwards, they have started asserting themselves. And the landmark was case one and Bharti case when they actually laid down, uh, or rather propounded the uh, theory of basic structure. When they said they drew a line, or rather Lakshman Rekha, for Parliament that you can amend the Constitution, but using your amending power under Article 368, you cannot change the basic structure of the Constitution. So that's the time when the Supreme Court, for the first time, in that at that scale, with that enormity, exerted its you know uh, its power uh, and asserted its power. But having said that, after that, the Supreme Court uh, uh, had to face a different kind of phase. Uh, Mrs. Gandhi's uh, assertion 
uh, from the executive and then emergency and thereafter. And then in the 80s, the Supreme Court, the same judges who were part of, uh, you know, ed infamous ADM Jabalpur case, they themselves, they invented what is known as the public interest litigation. They relaxed the uh, requirement of locus standi and they allowed somebody like somebody who is uh, acting bona fide, they can approach the Supreme Court on behalf of the downtrodden poor. So over the decades, they changed as an institution. But what lacks is, and a particular point about Justice uh, Gogoi's uh, uh, statement, that Supreme Court has tilted towards idealism. And the, even if you say they have tilted towards idealism, particularly after uh, uh, relaxing the uh, requirement of locus standi and promoting public interest litigation, it has uh, its own uh, uh, you know, pitfalls. But despite that, where I don't agree with Justice Gogai is the point that the Supreme Court has tilted towards idealism. An example given is the latest Saira Banu case, the triple talaq case. In triple talaq case, what has been done by the Supreme Court, to my understanding, it's nothing beyond tokenism. Why? Because triple talaq in one sitting has been declared unconstitutional. That's it. But in three sittings, over a period of three months, the same thing would be valid. Still, out of the five judges, only two tried to test it on the touchstone of constitutional principles and provisions. Justice Korean Joseph started his verdict by quoting Quran and ended his verdict by quoting Quran. Justice uh, J. S. Kher, who was the Chief Justice of mm -hmm. India at that mm -hmm. time, and Justice Nazir, they did not find anything wrong with triple talaq. That's sure. a different thing that they said it is fine, it is part of the practice. And Justice Kurian Joseph said it's wrong not because the Constitution says it's wrong. This, he said it is wrong because the Islamic practices does not uh, permit it. Only two of the five judges tried to test it on the principles of constitutional uh, provisions. Right. And that is, uh, uh, that, that is something problematic. So in that circumstance and citing this judgment to say that Supreme Court has tilted towards idealism, uh, I, I think it's sure. you know, slightly... Another example also of 66A was 66, given. 66, yes, yes. yes. We'll talk about that in just a bit, but let me bring in the other panelists as well. You know, Justice Sodhi, how has the top court evolved over time? You see, if you look at uh, its interpretations of Article 21, that's, that's been the most uh, widely uh, talked of article. Uh, it has evolved, it has expanded its scope from a mere existence to the quality of life as we see, as, as we uh, have heard the court say time and again. Now, uh, within this ambit of Article 21, lots of things have happened because society has evolved and society has become more, uh, more aware of their rights. Uh, all this is all evolution. Evolution, it does not mean that you, we become idealistic or practical. These are evolutions because the, static, the Constitution is not a static subject. That is how it is dealt with. But uh, to, to, uh, to say it is idealistic and not practical, things like, the, uh, like that, I don't think are apt words or expressions to be used while, uh, while interpreting the mood of the of the uh, apex court. So, oh, you know, Mr. Sorabji, with the uh, legislature not uh, keeping up yeah. with the times, is the onus then on the judiciary really to keep pace with what's happening in society? Yes, the Supreme Court, the judiciary can't fold its hands and say we can't do anything about it. It's for the legislature to do. It would really not be performing its duty of enlarging and protecting fundamental rights. I think it's realism, if you ask me. I don't want to do idealism or the otherism, it's realism. The Supreme Court is realizing, as I said, that there are different ideologies, there are different values, there are different problems which call for solution from the court and it requires a realistic interpretation of the problem. You know, in doing so, some people even suggest that the judges are overreaching and it's a, it's a, 
It's a case of judicial overreach. Is that what's happening in the country today? Asking me? Yeah, yes, Mr. Sorabji. Hello? The question is for you. No, 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 no. No question of overreach. No, I don't agree. Not a question of overreach. It's a question of really looking at a problem in a way it did not look before. Okay, you're looking at a problem like how as you... As you know, as we all agreed... Yes, go ahead, go static. ahead. So therefore, when the Supreme Court does it, it really takes into account the existing forces, existing circumstances, existing ideologies. And as I said, it can't fold its hand and say, oh, we can't do anything, it's for the government to do, it's for the executive to do. If they do that, I think they'd be really not discharging the main function of protecting, promoting, and enlarging fundamental rights. So, sure. Satya Prakash, you know, what is it that the courts couldn't do then that they can do now and why? See, uh, by and large, Supreme Court has been a status quoist institution. Uh, uh, they barely, uh, very rarely, they will go with, uh, uh, if you can say, forces of change. There are two ways to see it. One is that society has changed. So, in the changed circumstances, they interpret a particular provision in a different manner. That is one. Second is, society remains by and large static, but since the judges are enlightened people, they interpret a const constitutional provision in such a manner that it gives a different direction to the society. The second thing is not happening. In most of the cases, since the society has changed, the judges, they interpret a particular provision in that context. So, second thing is happening leading the society by way of constitutional. It has happened in certain cases like uh, you mentioned 66A mm, and some mm. of the, there are other verdicts also. But when it is the most needed, they will say, no, no, we can't do it. And th they will exercise restraint when activism is needed. They will be active when maybe I would say restraint is needed. So this kind of, uh, there are, Supreme Court is not just one, one Supreme Court. There are judges they have their own uh, you know uh, entire background of education of bringing uh, uh, understanding of society uh, so many issues but by and large if you interpret it as an institution my grievance is when they were needed to be active they said no we'll maintain restraint when they are asked uh, they are required to be uh, to maintain restraint they will be active i'll give you example in delhi Quite often, we have uh, seen lots of PILs on very petty issues in Delhi High Court or Supreme Court, lots of issues. But when it was needed to intervene in Delhi in 1984, uh, anti-Sikh riots uh, after assassination of Mrs. Gandhi, the Supreme Court could have intervened. They did not. And there are lots of issues where they intervene. I am saying when you are needed to intervene, you must. But this. Uh, uh, some sort of, uh, I don't know what happens as an institution, it depends upon who uh, the um, person is actually who is uh, heading the institution. But apart from that, if you analyze the Supreme Court as an institution, this dichotomy is writ large. So when, I, I, I and, think, and I think, second, second yeah. uh, I see another problem. Um, uh, we have talked about uh, judicial activism and overreach. Of course, there are instances of overreach in several cases, including um, uh, uh, judicial appointments. But the worst is, uh, has started. There is a trend, not just in uh, the Supreme Court, in various high courts also. There is a trend of judicial populism. Uh, in certain cases, judges would do certain things not because it is required to be done, but because they think it will not be, uh, it would be appreciated by people. Judges are not supposed to go by popular, you know, uh, uh, thinking. Sentiments. Yes. Sentiments. They are supposed to go by what is required constitutionally. So there is a danger of judicial activism and overreach lapsing into judicial populism. So okay. that's that's the real danger. So, you know, let's let's see what Justice Sodhi has to say about what you think, Justice Sodhi. Do you subscribe to the grievances uh, uh, raised by Satya Prakash right now? Uh, well, no, not really. You know, there's no such thing as overreach or uh, the Supreme Court not standing up when it is required to be st 
or, or buckling down when it, uh, when it should have stood up. You know, the Supreme Court has been quite consistent throughout, except lately, yes, because of the evolving constitutional provisions and uh, keeping them in, in consonance with the, with the aspiration of the people of this country and the requirements of conditions that, that, that mold uh, such aspirations, uh, the static, the constitution not being static as it is, uh, the Supreme Court has stepped in. And wherever there is a gray area or an area not legislated enough or not being legislated at all, the Supreme Court has filled in the gap. But to say that uh, uh, popularism and, um, and uh, th this, I think, is not really being fair. Uh, because uh, some cases are being reported, others are not being reported, doesn't mean that uh, the, the, the press and the, and, the, and, the, and the court are in collusion or something. I, I don't agree with that part. Okay, you know, Mr. S Mr. Sorabji, there have been several landmark judgments passed over the one year or so, you know, the triple talaq case, the passive euthanasia uh, issue, <coughs> ban on crackers, you know, the, recognize, uh, the recognition of the third gender, uh, right to privacy as a fundamental right. You know, several landmark judgments passed over the last one year. What can be attributed yeah. to that? Yes. It is. It be attributed to the court's really thinking that fundamental rights should be enlarged, protected. And actually, it's in that mode. Please understand one thing. <clears throat> I agree with Justice Sodhi, there's no such thing as overreach. It's a question of how you look at it. It's a question of the court reacting or responding to the current needs of society, the current aspirations of the people who are marginalized or oppressed, and then passing its verdict in that of the situation, in that of the circumstances. I think it's really the court is really being realistic. It's realism, and that is something which I welcome. You can't take the view that, oh, it's for the legislature to do it, it's for the executive to do it. If that is so, I'm afraid our fundamental rights will be mere, merely on paper. Okay, you know, Satya Prakash, let me bring you in now and talk about uh, taking the discussion forward, talking about what something else that uh, Justice Gugoy, in fact, said. He said that through the shift, the Supreme Court was gradually enriching the culture of constitutionalism. What does he mean by that? See, the term constitutionalism means placing limitations on organs of the state and those manning these organs. Uh, 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 this is the crux of the matter. So whosoever is manning these institutions, should, there should be checks and balances. And there are various facets of constitutionalism. One is checks and balances, the other is rule of law, separation of power. There was Surprisingly, and to my understanding, in many cases, the Supreme Court has violated constitutionalism. And the worst case is judicial appointments. And there are many in which judicial overreach is happening and the basic structure laid down by the Supreme Court itself in case one and Bharti case is being violated by the Supreme Court. This is a very serious case. And many constitutional uh, experts have written about it and they have raised concern about it. In Parliament also, in various debates, the issue has been read, raised. Constitutionalism means, I am saying the basic tenet is, the basic concept is placing limitations on powers of various organs of the state and drawing the line, separation of power, rule of law. The problem is the Supreme Court would lay down everything for all other organs of the state. But when it comes to Supreme Court, there is nobody to tell the Supreme Court what is right or wrong. The Supreme Court needs to exercise restraint and it's need, it needs to ponder over certain things and certain issues highlighted by the executive and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, the political class in general, the legislature in particular. And they need to ponder over these issues and judicial overreach, which many a time it borders you know, uh, 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 violation of separation of power, one of the basic uh, 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 principles on which our entire constitution is based. I, I'd give you one or two examples. One mm. is judicial uh, appointment. Appointments, we have discussed yes. several times. Second is uh, uh, Mr. Swarabji uh, would know it much more about. Uh, it's about uh, forest bench of the Supreme Court. It has done a tremendous work in saving forest, but 
is it the job of the Supreme Court to look into all those things? That's primarily the job of the executive. You cannot usurp that function from the executive. You can oversee that. The fallout is, if the decision is taken by the Supreme Court, you lose the right to appeal. If the executive has taken decision, you can go to the Supreme Court. Mm. If that function of the executive has been taken over by the judiciary, where do we go in case we have any grievance against that? So there are several uh, structural problems which are happening nowadays. Uh, in the last couple of decades, it needs to be corrected. What is required is a course correction. Okay, a course correction is required going forward to ensure that the judiciary in the, is in a better place is what Satya Prakash is suggesting. I want to go back to a point that Mr. Sorabji was making about fundamental rights. Justice Sodhi, uh, how is the court empowering the individuals vis-a-vis -vis the state? See, if you, uh, if you may have noticed, uh, uh, the scope and uh, interpretations <clears throat> on the fundamental rights of Article 21 really have evolved over a period of time. See, Article 21, when it began, for what I know is, was, was merely right to life. But today, the scope is so broad and so, so amplified that every human being in this country, irrespective of citizen, has a particular right which is guaranteed by the Constitution, and that is right to, to not mere existence, animal existence, but dignity and, uh, uh, and, and fulfillment of all his uh, aspirations. Now, all those are interpretations of the Constitution and giving it a wider uh, um, uh, meaning and amplifications, thereby empowering the people of, the, of this country to, uh, uh, to, uh, to a, a, a fair share of governance and also the, the nature of governance that, that, is, that, that they want to, be, uh, wanted to, uh, want to be governed by. All that comes in by the enlargement of, the, of uh, interpretations and scopes. This is done by the Supreme Court. Supreme Court, in fact, is empowering the people. It is we the people and it is giving to we the people the actual power. Uh, and to, to go back to Mr. Satya Prakash's uh, grievances of uh, uh, constitutional uh, hijacking, yes, they, are provision, they have been instances, and I agree with him, judicial appointments being, being one. But that but that uh, may have been necessary because uh, the legislature, wherever it is sleeping or wherever it is not uh, actively participating in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the progress, needs to be woken up. And the, and the Supreme Court is doing its job. Uh, we, it just can't uh, wish away everything that the, let the legislature do it. If the legislature is not doing it and the need of the hour is that somebody steps in, it has to be done so, and Supreme Court is rightly doing so. Sure. You know, Mr. Sorabji, uh, do you, would you then say that, you know, more importance is being given to individuals and individual rights these days? Um, look, I don't understand this. Or each. The whole question is, what do you want the Supreme Court to do? What's the meaning of life? Does life mean mere physical existence? Or does it mean the right to live with dignity? That the Supreme Court has even, in the case of passive euthanasia, said you can die with dignity. Now the question is, it is the response of the court to the situation prevailing in society at a particular time, and which is called so, a mediation. I don't agree it's reserving the right of the executive. On the contrary, it tells the executive to do its work in accordance with the Constitution. Okay, you know, Satya Prakash, one closing comment now on the program. You know, going forward, how do we see uh, the judiciary evolving and what's, what's likely to happen in the days to come? See, one is, uh, as an institution, judiciary has evolved over the decade, as I pointed out in the beginning. Second is the role of the Supreme Court in India's democracy is very vital. At crucial times, barring a couple of exceptions, particularly during emergency, they have by and large uh, stood by the rights of the people. They have protected and we have uh, let recent pass. There are several verdicts, Article uh, Section 66A of the IT Act, 
uh, Sarah single case is one of the best examples. It's a wonderfully written judgment. But by and large, they have stood by and they have tried to expand the scope and ambit of Article 21, even Article 19, uh, media yeah. freedom and freedom of speech and expression. And uh, time again, the, time and again, the Supreme Court would say no, no censorship, nothing, even on films. They have stood by the producers, the directors. But this is on the larger structural issues, not on uh, fundamental rights issue. Mostly, I said, barring exceptions, uh, uh, they have been with uh, the people and they have expanded the scope of basic fundamental rights. But the structural issues, when it comes to the interrelationship uh, relationship between the three organs of the state, mm -hmm. the executive, the judici judiciary and legislature, there the balance appears to be tilted towards the judiciary. Judiciary needs to ponder over that. And uh, it's not just I am uh, uh, advancing this um, argument. There have been grievances uh, and that uh, raised by uh, our parliamentarians and from the executive also. So it needs to be addressed. And as an institute, it requires institutional answer. It cannot be one uh, argument or case here and there. Sure. They need to ponder over it. And it requires judicial um, uh, institutional response to that. Okay, all right. On that note, then we'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. I'd like to thank all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. That's it from me. See you again next time.